We were singing this song. He's dead, he's dead, and gone with the winner. We were singing this song. He's done it. Hallelujah, flow like a river. Coming back to life. Each and so divine. Your love is like springtime. Seaside. So nice to see you all, friendly faces. Hope you got your coffees. Donuts later. We stand with us and worship our Lord. Tempted. 
empty place, the treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along and put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied.
happy to be here. Good morning, those of you live streaming at home. Glad that you have invited us into your living rooms, and hello out in the tent as well. Go ahead and have a seat, and junior hires, if you follow Grant and Jack out the back door, that'd be awesome. All right, for those of you that might be visiting with us today, uh, at the, by the front door there's an offering box, ba- box, and right next to it are some prayer cards, and if you fill them out, they'll get uh, sent out to our entire prayer team. They would love the privilege of praying for you. And there's also a table outside the tent that has the prayer cards on them as well. There's two restrooms down the hallway there and one right over here behind the soundboard. Uh, You're welcome, obviously, to use those. All right. So a couple of things that are going on around here. First of all, tomorrow night, uh, the women, they're having their Let's Gather. And Dana Bonilla is going to be sharing. Dana, I saw her earlier. I think she's checking kids in or whatever. But Dana and Andres are here today. So if you get a chance to welcome them. Uh, And Dana will be sharing tomorrow night at the dinner. If you've not yet signed up, there's a good group. I think I counted this morning like 75 that have signed up. So if you've not yet signed up, you can today. But do do it right out at the table. Talk to Martha or Yvette or my wife Jeanette. And they'd be happy to sign you up. Uh, for the dinner tonight. And then on uh, July 8th is Love HB. And Love HB is, uh, there's a collective of churches that have created an organization called Serve City. And it's a way to serve our city. To, and so uh, on July 8th, we're going to be painting the library at Oakview, the outside of it. And there will also be barbecuing for the neighbors and just uh, do a neighborhood cleanup if we get enough people to to sign up for it. So the easiest thing to do is go onto our website on the homepage and you'll see the Love HB and then there'll be a place to click and all you do is enter your name and uh, how many are coming if you're coming in the morning or the afternoon. So 9 to 12 or 12 to 4. So we'd love to have as many people as possible sign up and be part of that. Um, And then uh, Mindy is hosting, well actually Tanner Orell is going to host of Trivia Night on the 16th here, Sunday the 16th at 6 o'clock. Uh, Tanner will have, uh, he's got it all planned out. It's going to be the, the magic of Tanner Orell for a Trivia Night. Just a reason to get together and have a good time and to support a local cause here in our community. So um, you'll keep getting information about that. And then on the 23rd, we have our uh, Connection Point Gathering. And this is designed for people who are new or newer or new-ish to Seaside. So, like, maybe you've been coming a while, but you've just been coming on Sundays, and it gives you an opportunity uh, to meet us, which is not that big a deal, but it gives us an opportunity to meet you and just hear a a tiny bit of your story and just let you know where Seaside is going, who we are, uh, where we're going, and and ways that you can connect. So we're hoping that... uh, You'd sign up for that, and again, it's on our our homepage, seasidehb.org, and you'll see the Connection Point logo that's up there on the screen, and and just click on that and sign up. Again, you just give us your name, and we'll feed you a a quick lunch after church, and it'll be a very brief, less than an hour gathering together. So look forward to seeing a a bunch of you at that. And then the following week, on July 30th, it is going to be a power-packed day. We have our Uh, Faith Community Sunday, and so we're going to get a little bit of junior high exposure here uh, on Sunday morning, and then we have a baptism on Sunday after, right after church, and again, that's for everyone, not just those that are being baptized, but if you are interested in being baptized, maybe, maybe you were baptized as an infant, and something's kind of tugging on you saying, yeah, maybe I should. I know for me, I was baptized as an infant. My parents had great intentions, but I didn't know who Jesus was until later in life. And so then I chose to be baptized as an adult. And so if anyone's interested in that, you can let us know. Uh, email us at seaside at seasidehb.org or contact anyone on the staff, and they'd be happy to give you information about that. But that's the 30th. It'll be at Guy and Patsy and John and Monica's house, and we'll have lunch, baptism, kids can play in the pool, and then... Right around 5 o'clock, we're going to have a backyard concert in John's backyard. Bob Bennett's going to be coming. And for those of you who uh, were around for the Jesus Revolution, the Jesus Movement back in the 70s, we'll know Bob Bennett very well. But uh, he's going to give us a little backyard concert on the 30th in John's backyard. I'm super excited about that. I've been playing some of his CDs the last couple of days and just like, ah, reminiscing. So really cool. All right, well, today, thank you, those of you that came early to help set up. There were a number of people 
that God asked and came. And uh, a lot of our high schoolers are away at high school camp. And so a lot of our Sunday morning setup and teardown people are gone. Thank you guys. It was, it was great. It was smooth. And if some of you would like to stay after for a few minutes and help us tear down the chairs, set up some tables for the women's dinner, that would be awesome as well. Yeah. Are you laughing back there, Wendy? I was counting on you. So. <laughs> All right. Let, let me lead us in prayer. In fact, why don't you stand and we'll pray and then we'll get back into uh, another, another opportunity to praise. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you, God, for your presence here today. And Lord, as we sing praises, may you be honored. Lord, as we fellowship together after the service, Lord, may we we encourage and build one another. And Lord, as uh, Mike brings us your message today, basically an overview of 2 Thessalonians, I pray, God, that you would speak through him by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would open up our ears to hear what you have for us and our hearts to receive all that you have for us. We love you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' powerful name, amen.
memo on that. There we go. Good morning, Seaside Community Church. My name is Mike Garrity. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks for that worship, and that's such a, it's a beautiful song and so appropriate today as I was thinking about the last few weeks of preparing. So uh, have a seat, and you can pull out your Bibles if you have them, electronic or paper, while I get booted up myself. We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians. A few of our friends that are live streaming, welcome as well. And glad you've joined us. And however you are here, we had a, a good series in 1 Thessalonians. Appreciate the the props to our brothers and sisters who came and shared for for weeks in that book. It's powerful. Um, We have a a new series starting the second book, and it's uh, it's gonna be the same theme. I I don't think, we need to get get some more of the now and not yet. And it's, 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 uh, it's very appropriate to both books, for sure. Understanding what that means to be here and now, but it's fully not yet driving the other day with my, my bride, I, I asked her, what's the theme we've been covering in First Thessalonians? I crossed my fingers and I prayed. <laughs> she nailed it. She nailed it. And now, not yet. And then I said, sweetie, what, what does that mean to you? And she did, she did pretty good. So if anybody needs more explanation, she's available after the service. <laughs> Go see Kim. She would love to talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom, Jesus brought the kingdom. It was present in his his very being, right? Where he went, the rule of God was present. And you could see it in the, the power, in the wonder, and in the love. But it's not yet, it's not complete. We need to grab hold of the fact that we're in between this age and the next age. We are what Paul calls pneumatikoi. We're spirit people. We are from a different place. We are still here. We don't hate this place. It needs redemption. And we are the agents of change and redemption in the hand of God. That's what Thessalonians is about sprinkled in chapters in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians, there's very eschatological end times text. We're going to just, I'm just going to, we're going to peek into it today. I'll refrain from digging too deep. We'll get to it. But those texts are to inform us of what and where we are. Who are we as spirit people? Why does that mean anything different as we walk through this life? as we raise our families and are employed and employers, we go to school and all that we do, it should inform and shape who we are. The title of my message, The Thessalonian Way. I've been reading this book over for the last few months. The church was new. We'll get to the history of it again and, and remind ourselves, but I just saw and captured three or four points there that are going to help us I hope to encourage, inspire us to try to walk a little bit more closer to Jesus, to know his lordship and his kingship, to embrace his kingdom a little bit more fully than we have up to this point. It was Paul's desire for sure. In fact, when he begins his ministry in the book of Acts, the church is described by the world and other people and the Christians themselves as the way. They're part of the way. Well, that word means a lot in our culture. It can identify a group, which it did, those group of people who follow the way. It can identify a path that we could go, and that certainly is appropriate for us as Christians because we are walking a new path. It also is a way or the manner in which we walk that makes us distinct and different. It's a powerful word. It's very vague, but it means so much. 
The Thessalonian way is the Christian way. It's the way of the kingdom. Paul's desire was for this church to know who they were in Christ. His desire was for them to live and thrive, to be steadfast, standing firm no matter what happened in order to obtain the glory that God wants to bestow on his people. He wants to glory in us as we learn to glory in him. So my aim today is to teach. We are going to overview. That's kind of my, my bent, and I'm going to refrain from going too much too far so I don't put anybody to sleep, but we want to overview the book. It's critical. I, I, I'm telling you, you got to eat your veggies. we got to understand the scriptures, get a little deeper. So I'm just going to make that plug. But ultimately, we want to hear the word of God today. We want to hear God speak to us so that we would be inspired we would be people of courage and encouragers to move forward and help others move forward. Y'all know Christianity's not easy. We go through trials and tribulations and difficulties. There's nothing simple about it. There's nothing easy about it. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. That's tongue in cheek right there. I think Jesus, he was, he was holding back on us just a little bit there. His point is, walk with me and I'll make it easier. But there's nothing easy about it. I've recently gone through my own personal challenge. I've shared with uh, the men's group, uh, uh, whatever, a month, two months ago, and many of you individually, a challenge, a vocational challenge, where the school I was at for 15 years, I wasn't invited back, so I've been let go, and I've been on this journey for about two months or so. A wilderness period, I'm gonna call it. Not in a negative sense, necessarily, though it felt pretty deserted at times. Have you been there? Have you been to those places where you feel like you're wandering and you don't have the particular goal in mind of where you're going and what's going to happen the next day? That's where I was at. I had to consider my way. I had to consider where I was going, the manner in which I was going to do it. Where was I going to? So after let, being let go, I, uh, the future was in question and, and certainly brought fears and anxieties, uh, doubts, insecurities. All those negative things came up pretty early on and they try to rear their ugly head uh, more often than I would like. I have to deal with those. I can get to action, put my boots to the ground and go find a job I could be, distract myself with other things and pretend it's all going to work out or sit idly and do nothing and God must, must do this for me. I entered into this new and uncomfortable world of LinkedIn and indeed of self-promotion. If you know me at all, as not my bent whatsoever. I dislike it immensely, but that's the game you have to play when you talk to new employers. Job postings, endless job postings being dropping into my email box. I won't even go through what they are. They're, they're outside of my wheelhouse, that's for sure. Resumes, rewriting, cover letters, emails, applications, interviews, Zoom interviews, being ghosted, <laughs> being ghosted. <laughs> I, I know I pushed send, I know I did. Sample lectures and lessons in front of new, new classrooms, rejections. Lord, where are you? I had two early prayers in the midst of this. Whew. Psalm 27.8 was one of the earliest psalms that I read. So appropriate. And just landed on it because God, God steered me there. And in verse 8, read the whole thing. In verse 8, come, my heart says. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. 
that set me into a trajectory of where my heart should be. Lechemar Levi, Bakshu Panai. Heart, I want to know the face of God. I've been, been walking with Jesus a long time with that gray haired guy right over there who's discipled me well. I've experienced the presence of God in many ways, but there was something new and something more God wanted to do, and I knew it, and I wanted to be prepared for that. Not living in fear, but living in his presence. Prayer number two was, yeah, vocation. Lord, where could you lead me? Could it be local, Lord, please? Could it be with like-minded people? who share the same faith, a community of believers? Could it be in the classroom? Could it be about scripture? Those were my prayers and they whittled down into some pretty specifics. But I wanted to seek the face of the Lord and for him to lead. Was God gonna be faithful to me? He has been. His record, his, his narrative in scripture is, is astounding, 100%. But sometimes those wilderness periods seem pretty dark and you don't see the light and we walk in faith. So as I dug into the scriptures like Psalm 27 and more, I could see his faithfulness. I'd listen to songs. I have a couple new artists that I'd my family's probably sick of. I listen to these, these words of worship and prayer. Mm. I could see his face. I could see his face in, in many of your faces, those who I've engaged with and shared with and you've shared back with me. In your tears, I've seen it. In your prayers, I felt it. In your stories, in your stories of God's faithfulness, Oh, it's been a really cool but a really hard journey. I'm thankful for it. Wherever we are, God knows. God's present. And he's working out his plan in each one of us. He knows who we are. He knows what he's gifted us with. So I've trusted in that. But it is ultimately our choice, isn't it, church? If you're in it like I am, or you've been, or you will be, God is faithful. He will bring you through these places to learn and grow. We can choose to live like homeless orphans, that we don't have a father, lost and stuck, living apathetic, or calling out the victim card consistently, because those employers don't know and they screwed me here and there, ain't gonna get you very far. This isn't our identity, church. You've come to this place today, I hope to hear that that's not your identity as a believer. We're children of God. We have a calling and a purpose. And I think one that's much deeper than what we ever think or imagine. We lower the bar. Like myself, thinking, yeah, it's just, I'll just be happy here. The king wants to use us. And he has a final destination for us. It's not about my life. I realize, be easy, immediately, early on, the reputation of this is what I do and this is who I am is a lie. It's a lie. I I was ready to be a barista or bartender, work at Walmart. I didn't care. I want to glory in you and sense your glory in me as your child. Hmm. It's not about our life. It's about the giver of the gift of life. So today it's time, I think, for for many of us to think and reconsider, uh, assess our, where we're at, our spiritual checkup. Embrace the wilderness for some. Stand firm, those who are in the midst of it. Embrace and prepare yourself when it comes. 
to reset our life and our course might be in order for you today. Recalibrating your life. Tweaking those instruments and the tools that we think that we have that help us to discern where we should be. Rethinking our life plans and our methods. So often we're too ill prepared. Reevaluating our life, our purpose, and our goals. And try to once again wash out the worldliness of what our culture says is important and true. And get back to the basics and reviving our determination and our courage to not live in fear. You hear that? To not live in fear, but to move forward as slow and as difficult as each step is in that wilderness period. Christ is with us. Wrap that around your heads. Let's, let's get to a little, little Bible background. To understand any scriptural book, there is so much to help us, and it takes a little digging. So let's dig just a little bit about the Thessalonians themselves. We need to understand they've been ensconced in a Greco-Roman empire that has their own trinity of beliefs. Loyalty, trust, and hope. Loyalty to a secular empire trust in a power, military power, hope in a man, Caesar, a corrupt man, but a human nonetheless. They lived right in the middle of that and had to understand that the kingdom is new and fresh and different and there's a different loyalty and a different faith and trust that we should have and we set ourselves on a different hope. The Thessalonian church, which we'll get to the background in a, in a minute, they were under great pressure to not live according to the Roman, Greco-Roman way. They had to find the Thessalonian way, the kingdom way, the Jesus way. And early on as believers, it was very difficult for them. The diversity, the wealth of that place. Uh, is there a map up there are we looking at? That's, that's down right now. Okay, it's all good. They, they were on the coast, and they were in a beautiful, deep, deep harbor. So you could imagine the wealth that came in and out of that place and how easy it is to take that wealthy route and say, I'm blessed by God because my pockets are filled, my bank accounts are loaded. We, we know that, that temptation. They were awarded what was called a free city. They were given status by the empire to say, you guys are good. You backed me in the right times. The politically, you put a stamp on them, says, you go, you do your thing. We're going to leave our paws off you a little bit. And you go do your thing. Do your Roman thing. There was pressure to hold on to that. And now here's this church rising up in the midst of that. To preserve individual security is not what the kingdom's about. It's not. This is our world. It's the same thing. We have the same pressures, the same temptations, the same culture screaming and raving at us, different messages. And we have to decide. We have to decide if we're going to follow the way of the kingdom, the Thessalonian way. Paul himself, what an amazing dude he was, author of many books in our New Testament, uh, a all-star in the book of Acts, and that's where we would find, if you wanted to do any background, you would read the book of Acts starting in chapter 15 or so to about 18, and you'll see what's going on and how he meets the Thessalonians and what's going on there. Acts chapter 15 says there's no small dissension, and he has an argument, a difficult, no small dissension. I think Luke's just putting a uh, tongue-in-cheek there and saying there was kind of a brawl going on amongst us Christian brothers. They were adamant, and he had to split with a guy named Barnabas, son of encouragement. He split with them. They were traveling together in the first missionary tour, and they, they, they weren't going to go again. They split up. Painful, hard, difficult. Chapter 16, uh, 15, uh, we'll meet Silvanius, Silas, who's mentioned in our book, in our text. We'll get to him in a minute. And Timothy. So those are the two other co-authors that go along with Paul. He meets them there. 
Paul doesn't roll alone. He's like, dude, I'm over this. Barnabas, okay, whatever. You go that way, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to do my own thing because that's way too painful. No. Paul locks arms again, and he finds two other individuals that become essential to his ministry. Paul's a dude. He could do it himself. I, if I pick anybody, he'd be my, my first-round draft pick. He was a villain and a hater of the church, turned in missionary, the great theologian, the first and greatest, probably pastor, theologian, and, and martyr. He gave it all up for Jesus. That's a dude. Paul's tours, he sees a vision, and it directs him to Macedonia, to where Thessalonica's at, and Philippi. God uses a vision to redirect him. He had a plan, he thought, and God shook him up in the middle of the night with a vision. Come over here, he sees an individual crying out, pleading with him, come, help us. And he's going to take the gospel from Asia into Europe. He's going to cross the waters and take it to a place it's never gone. One step closer to the, to the, to the snake's den, Rome itself, the head of the beast. He goes there and he goes immediately to a synagogue, he begins to preach, and he says it's there for three weeks or so. Give it a month, two months, it doesn't matter. He's there for a very short time, proclaiming Christ, and these people receive the message. And then the city turns into an uproar because they're turning the world upside down. The church starts in the midst of persecution, hostility. That doesn't sound like a great start. Those are the, we would think, oh, Lord, you must be speaking to me. This isn't good. Let's go somewhere else. Paul said, no. If Sam's putting up the book of Acts. Get to read it. I'm trying to just keep pushing on. It's a great background story. The Thessalonians had a rough start. They turned from their idols and they turned to the living God. They were scorned and they... They, were, they suffered, but they didn't give up. They didn't go back. They had that steadfastness that Paul proclaims in both these letters, over and over. They had questions and doubts like we do in, their, in wilderness periods, but they stayed faithful to the course. This is the Christian life. I don't think I'd be a great evangelist because I think I'd, put, I'd just put too much of that out there. Like, I'm going to tell you the truth. Jesus is awesome. going to be ha- hard. An overview of the book, can we put the, that chart up, Sam? Is that ready? I'm not completely thrilled with this. Uh, I need some more work on it, but here's a good start. The book's got three chapters. There's three pretty good sections that block off. If you're going to do a deeper dive into any book, this is critical to understand the literary context, how it's laid out. What is the the themes, what is the author doing? How does he progress through the book? And as we do this over the next six weeks or so, seven weeks, um, hopefully you'll get a sense of that, where Paul's going and where he begins. I'll leave it at that. Let's get to the meat. I want to talk about principles, the things that we stand on. The principles of the Thessalonian way, I'm going to call it today. But ultimately, it's the now and not yet kingdom principles. The Thessalonican church had these things. And we need them. We need them here at Seaside. We need them in our lives everywhere that we go. There's four points I'll make. Where people who live in community. We can't get away from that. There's no Lone Rangers. Paul himself, the apostle himself, did not live apart from community. He recognized and realized how significant it was. You are all here in this community. How much we participate in it is up to us. The more we do, the better the community is and the better we are as well. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, 
It says, Paul, Salvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in our God, uh, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a typical opening for Paul. He uses this many times in his letters. He does add one unique word here, and it's the word our. Our Father. Throughout these books, of Thess- the Thessalonian books, and particularly in 2 Thessalonians, he uses the word our and all many times. He doesn't use the word unity, but this is what he means. We are together in this. He is our Father. This is our church, our community. It is our way. He goes on and on and on. It's a small little word in English, and we blow right through it, but it's impactful and meaningful for Paul as he repeats it over and over and over about every four verses. He uses the word all numerous times in these these epistles. All of us, we are all together in this. We all must do this. We all have to be on the same page. Look at us, look at this group right here of a couple hundred people. That's not easy to do, to be all on the same page, to be pulling at the same time, pulling the oars at the same time. So we're going in the same direction. That's the job of the pastors. Getting us stroking together. Seaside does this well. And we can do better. See, Paul didn't see the church as a project. He saw them as a people. God's people. Let me fix you all up and get you all here and then I'm out of here. Good luck. That's not Paul's deal. In fact, let's not make light of the fact that he writes two epistles to these guys. He could have written more. We only have two. And he writes them almost back to back. After only a few months, he writes a second letter back to this church to address some particular issues and once again to inspire and encourage them to stand fast. Let's don't, let's don't take that lightly. It's the, the incessant, consistent support that we can give one another that makes us a community. Not that I'm gonna throw it out there once and yeah, good luck to you. It's I'm with you, I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it with you. That, that's what makes us strong. What we need for the church. Number two, community of grace and peace. So in verse two, again, we read this in almost every one of Paul's epistles where he lavishes on them some kind of a prayer, a blessing of grace and peace to you. We could spend a whole afternoon talking about those words. To the Greeks and to that time period, it, it meant something much different. I think when we hear it, we think, oh, free. We think easy. Forgiven, I'm good, and he just, just, he just washes over it. And there's that much truth to that, the word charis in Greek. In Paul's world, there was a patron-client relations that went on in the Greco-Roman world. The client was the rich guy, the patron was the rich guy, and the client was the one who kind of fell on his coattails and and saw the breadcrumbs fall off his table, and every once in a while, they get some good stuff. It was relational, because the patron did give things to the client. God does give us things gifts us with many things. And we are to receive those humbly and with gratitude. What it's missing is that there is to be a reciprocation of trust and loyalty back to the one who gives. It's not free. It's free, but it's not free. If you really received it and understand what it meant, you would willingly give yourself your trust and your loyalty to. That's our calling, is to be lavish with God's grace so deeply that obedience is not a chore, a task. 
It's our privilege. Our privilege to walk in God's ways, in his word, because he loves us and it is the best way. That's a huge hump to get over. And I remember in my Christian walk, being a Pharisee about the laws and tossing a few to the side, like that can't apply to me right now. I don't like that one. Coming to a place of embracing it all. No different than what I'm going through presently today. I have my own dreams and aspirations and what I think I should be, so my reputation's where I think it should be at. I could be honored by man, or I can lay myself before the cross. What a beautiful song. And it reminded me, because I've got in the habit of, of stretching as an older guy, and so the last year or so, every morning, I, I just, I have to stretch. And we have this huge barn door. We got up in, you know, in, our, in our bedroom. It's like an eight-foot door. It's ginormous, and it has this, it's just got a huge cross on it. It's really cool. And I hit the floor on my stretching, and my first stretch is it's just in front of that cross. It's just yielding myself to the lordship of Jesus Christ, the king of kings, who on that cross displayed God's love and accepted the authority of heaven and earth because he was on that cross. I'm like, that's who I serve. As I lay there and I stretch and I start, I start my day seeking the peace of the Lord, knowing he is the king of kings and he is my king and he is my Lord. And the fears that I wake up with, like, oh my gosh, I gotta start looking at, 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 at all the, the uh, the notifications are coming up because every morning there's like hundreds. I got to call these people back and I got them and I'm all panicked. No, I, I found myself on my face before God. However and wherever you're going to do that, we all need to do it. To live as people of grace and in peace, it is not the absence, my friends, of conflict. You don't have to be on this world but a few days and you realize life's not easy. Things don't always go your way. Find the Prince of Peace and begin your day with your your face towards his face, seeing his face. The third, a community of encouragement. Encouragement. Paul had a team, and he worked together with that team. And the churches that he met, they needed encouragement. We all do. Imagine your life. Imagine our world where people walked around and just built each other up instead of tearing each other down. I can't even fathom that. That's a new world, and we're building it. You get it? It's now and not yet. We're building it. We need to become better and recognize the power of our words, the life-giving power of our words. God himself, in the beginning, spoke into existence, creation. And he says, I want you to be fruitful and multiply. And he's given us that ability to speak and communicate to each other with a very similar power that changes chaos into order. What's that song? Bones into armies. Life-changing words that we can speak into one another. And not just our words, but our actions can encourage as well. Empowering people. Creating trees that are lacking nutrients and watch them blossom and become fruitful as we're called to be fruitful and multiply. Paul cheers on the progress of the Thessalonians. He reminds them to imitate. That's an encouragement. Watch me. Do you remember what I did when I was with you? Imitate me. 
He prays intercessory prayer for the churches. Encouragement. He teaches the traditions and the ways that the Lord needs us to understand and know so that we could find that hope and that justice. I can't even begin to express the gratitude I have for so many of you, and you know who you are, because we text and we call, and you encouraged me and strengthened me because the walk I'm on, I'm not alone, and I didn't feel alone. It's so powerful. When the church grabs hold of that truth, look out. We're gonna change the world. Verse three, we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right, because your faith is growing abundant and your love of every one of you for, all, for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you amongst the churches of God for your steadfastness faith during, during all your persecution and affliction that you are enduring. I told John I wasn't gonna do any of his verses, but at least I'm gonna read that one. You can flesh that out a little bit more. But do you see the encouragement? He's so thankful for them. And he tells them why. They're growing. They're growing in their love. They're growing in their faith. He boasts about them. How do you think that, that they feel when they hear that from the Apostle Paul? Dude, that guy's all on us. He loves us. Let's, let's go. And trust me, the Thessalonian church wasn't perfect. Far from it. They were newbies at best. You could imagine walking into a church going, dude, this is, the, this is the church I'm reading the letters about. They had their issues, their problems. And he's just boasting about them. He's encouraging them. That's our job. It's not about waiting until you're perfect. Then I'll tell you how perfect you are, how great you are. It's inspiring people. At the bottom rung level to step up to the next step, right? Telling you, I felt it. I needed it. And I'm so grateful for it. I found this video online. It's amazing. Just, just run it. Just look at the details of what's going on here. Uh, actually, pause. I will set it up. Just one second. The young guy, his uh, family, his older brothers have been going to this, I don't know, you call it dojo or whatever, um, this gym uh, to work out and, and get his belts or whatnot. I'm pretty ignorant about the whole thing. But he's a young dude, and he's, he's moving up where his brothers are at, and he wants, he wants to get his next belt. And the, and the sensei said, you got your next belt. Pass all this stuff. You don't have to break any boards. And he's like, no, I won't break the board, man. And he was adamant. But the guy said, if you don't break the board, you don't pass. If you don't accomplish the task, you don't pass. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to do it. Bring it up hard and bring it down fast. Hard and fast. Let's go, boy. Don't fall. You gotta stay your feet. Don't fall. Phoenix, go straight through. Can that kid pick him up? Make a fight. He says it goes up. Now hit hard. Hit it with the heel. Hit it with the heel. Hit it with the heel. Yes, you can do it. Come on. Yes, you can do it. You gotta do this now. Look at me. You have to hit it hard, though. You cannot hit it light. You have to hit it hard. Go. How inspiring is that? 
when we feel like we're just kind of just dropping our foot on, like, oh, God, this is going to hurt me. Yes. And the cheer of the crowd and that, that, that young man who picked him up. So we're a team. You can do it. That's inspiring. It's encouragement that builds courage in us. Church, we can't be stopped when we, when we learn that lesson. That's a Thessalonian way. And many of you are so good at it. And there's others of us, we need to grow. Because we can be way more critical. Last Wednesday, I received a job offer. Yay! I'm thankful that it wasn't a 40-year journey. God is so faithful. It's local, with like-minded people. It's a teaching position, and it's teaching scripture. Amen. I'm so thankful. And it's for us to rejoice together. For my peeps out there that, that I've been shared with and you've watched me walk through the journey. One more point here and it's the, the other side of, of encouragement. We need to be a community of exhortation. We should just stop with the happy and the, and the, the good stuff right there, but this is important to exhort, to admonish, to urge on. Thessalonians had a problem. The first letter Paul discusses talks about the second coming of Jesus and how, how important it is that we'll be caught up with him so we have this hope, fantastic it didn't take but a few weeks to months later that the church got a little off track in two different ways. They're going to go to extremes. One side we'll call apoc apocalyptic enthusiasm. They're going to get into the end time stuff. And they're going to get all fired up and excited about it and get overboard on it. And the other side became totally irresponsible in their behavior thinking Jesus has already returned. So therefore, whatever, what do I need to do? Let's just chill and, and experience the kingdom. Paul needs to deal with this. In a church, in a group, with a gathering, a family this size, there'll be issues, right? We need to learn as a family how to deal with those things. Encouragement is one, but there is need for exhortation to be clear. And this letter does not address, it's not a full book on how to do that and do it well, but he gives us a couple things to look at. And so my job today, again, is just, let's just lay this out, and as we begin to study, we'll see in more detail how Paul deals with some of these problems. Let's look at verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. If you don't know eschatology, the study of end things, I spent many, many moons uh, dealing with this text and others in the book of Revelation. Chapter 2 is huge. It's got all kinds of goodies in there if you're a Bible nerd. And if you're not, you'll, your head will swim and you'll just, you'll, you'll just swim right by it. You're like, forget this. Look at how it starts. The problem or the context. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as, it's from, as you think it's from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already been here. Somebody's teaching and maybe even using Paul to say Jesus has already come. He did? I missed that one. I'm sorry. And so some people embraced that like crazy, and they went nuts with apocalyptic fervor. 
everything was about the end and how we're supposed to live in the end. And, and there's, there's nothing wrong with studying eschatology. There's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with digging in and trying to understand these difficult texts. It's fantastic. But it, you can err when you arrogantly think that you have the ultimate truth and how it's all going to go. Put up that chart. I found this in the archives as I'm moving from out of my school into my home. My wife's thrilled with all the new boxes and books I'm bringing home. <laughs> and I found this little, little piece of paper that's over 30 years old, easy. In the midst of the 1980s, when I was into my apocalyptic fervor, I made a chart. I didn't dare try to do this on Microsoft Google or uh, Word or, or Google Docs. There's a lot of stuff in there. And the scriptures are filled with all the things that we, need, we could understand and what's mentioned. We can't become overly enthusiastic. I haven't seen this for 30 years. I haven't looked at it. I haven't created a new one of how I think it's all going to happen. I, I just, yeah, it's not that important to me right now. Maybe one day we'll do a study here and I'll dig back into it. You may be overly enthusiastic about your eschatology if you're willing to pay cash to me for that chart right now. <laughs> you may be overly enthusiastic if you break fellowship with another brother or sister because their charts differ from yours. You may be overly enthusiastic if you're willing to sell your house and buy tracts and deliver those tracts, gospel tracts to other people. You may be overly enthusiastic if you ask me to sell my house and buy tracts and go share the gospel. You may be overly enthusiastic if you have the return of Jesus date circled on your calendar. <laughs> the issues, the questions, the theological things that are going to go on, and Paul loads up this material about the rebellion, the lawless one, the restrainer that's holding back the lawless one, the career of the lawless one, and what he's going to do, the delusion that happens at the end, or even the elect seem to be deluded and might follow this uh, lawless one. The Antichrist, you name it, all of it. it he, he just dumps it all in here. He says, look, don't get too excited. These things have to happen first. So 1 Thessalonians is about, let's get excited. Jesus is going to come get us. So the dead that you're all worried about, they're going to rise first. No sweat. God's got this. God's got this. A couple months later, ho, ho, pull back the reins, pump the brakes, be careful. Don't make this a point of breaking fellowship. You remember what happened in ch chapter 2, verse 1? That people were becoming alarmed, worried, in fret. If you don't think this way, then we can't fellowship. And you're not a true believer. It's clear as day in Scripture. Really? It's a dangerous place to be for a community to dwell together in unity. Let's study eschatology. Let's draw our charts if that's what you want to do. Let's dialogue. But let's love. Let's be gracious. Let's be encouraging. We can do that. And we can talk and fellowship with other churches who have different charts than we do. Paul's primary focus, um, chapter 2, 13, at the end of the chapter, he's going to go for about 10 verses talking about all that's going on. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to refrain from opening up my Bible uh, if it's posted up on there. He is going to talk about all that's going on, but his focus at the end is not about eschatology. It's not. It's not, you know, you, got, you better get this right. You better make your chart. When I come back, I want to see that chart. He has a much more primary focus. Verse 13, but we must always give thanks. Right after his eschatological discourse, he says we must give thanks to God. Why? Because God chose you as the first fruits of salvation. He talks about election, that we've been elected by God. That we have a salvation that's secure. That's what's important. The sanctification of the Spirit, 
the work that he does in and through us, the belief, the faith that we have in the truths that have been taught to us, that's what he emphasizes. And we should never get away from it. For this purpose, verse 14, he called you so that you may obtain what? The glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, verse 15, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions. Hold fast to what, he's, what I've, I've been teaching you, that you, uh, that you were taught by us, either by word or by mouth or by letter. And then he closes that, that chapter, chapter two, with this. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and in every good word. In what we say and what we do, live in that comfort and that strength of who we are. We can get out of balance if we just read that little, that little 10 verse section and think that's what it's all about. It isn't what it's all about. And I'm looking forward to the coming. But not at the detriment of doing the work that God has for us right here. The second problem are idle people. That's the translation of the New Revised Standard Version. There's other translations about being disorderly. It's probably a better word for us to understand. Idle might be if you think you're sitting on a couch, you know, popping bonbons and, and watching Oprah. Uh, throughout the day, and that's probably true for some. Some of these people heard the message, oh, Jesus is back, good, let's chill. Kick up my feet, grab a drink, and watch some TV. Not, not good. This is the harder part. When we talk about exhortation, Paul's first exhortation is not about you're wrong and you better get your act straight. He just lovingly points them back, where? To the primary calling of the church, our salvation, the security that we have in it, the sanctification of the Spirit. He calls us back. What a beautiful exhortation though that is. But here, it gets a little bit more, hey, don't sit down here. We got work to do. And if they're being disorderly, not just idle, not coming to church, if they're being disorderly in the body, that has to be dealt with. Agreed? You can't have a family cleanup day and have somebody sitting there on the couch, not, not helping. And you have the siblings, right? It doesn't work. You gotta step up and exhort and urge and encourage. But even with that, and he's gonna give very clear, distinct commands of what they should do. But I want you to see that in chapter three, he still points to the primary concerns and focus. Verse chapter three, one through five, spreading the gospel. Pray for us that the word would spread. That God would protect us in our ministry. Give us direction. But he does give direct commands to stay away from, keep away, imitate us, don't weary to do what is right and necessary. Parents all know what that looks like and how hard that is at times to do what's right. Warn them, not as unbelievers, but as believers. Whoever's gonna do that chapter three text is gonna be weak, so they're gonna forget I'm chatting about it a little bit. Our point is what? Encouragement and exhortation have to be part of our vocabulary here if we are going to be a strong Thessalonian type church, agreed? We have to do that, but we have to do it well. And there's a whole plethora of problems with people who love to exhort. I got the gift of exhortation. You're like, no, oh, man, you need to learn the, the, the lesson or the, the gift of encouragement first. And Paul does that. He just sandwiches good with a, yeah, 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 yeah good, yeah. What about this? He does that well. We need to learn how to speak the truth to one another in relationship. And when we have relationship and we have trust, you can say hard things. I've had those conversations, John and Larry, a few years ago. They had to put me in my place. And they did it in such a loving way because I know these guys. And I was in tears. I felt so bad, but I needed it. I needed it. 
to be put back in my place. It's for the health of the community that we do, not for the braggadocious, look who I am, and I'm standing over you. I'm better than you. Because we want to be the body of Christ. We want to glory in Christ and to express the glory, he's expressed glory on us. That image of everybody just loving on Phoenix was his name, it's just priceless and life-changing to that kid. He did it, but he did it with this, the help and encouragement of that, that whole group of people. That's powerful. What a lesson. That's the Thessalonian way. Those are four small little pieces right there, and there's so much more we could say. That's for another time and another week. Today, can we consider ourselves people of this community, and how can we become more part of the community? Can we grow in our grace and our peace for one another? Expressing grace and peace. Can we learn to be encouragers, courage builders? Because there's some who need it desperately. Needed it desperately. And it brought life and success. In one small battle, one small wilderness journey that I went through, in a community of exhortation, it's not afraid of the truth. Not afraid of hearing the truth. Humbly. Seaside, join me together. Join together, one hand in hand, to walk the Thessalonian way. Pray. Here, you want to do a work in this right now, I know. I pray the cares of the world, the, the fears and anxieties that so easily we can feel and cause us to drift away from you to not see your face clearly. I pray that we'd have the courage today to sit right where we're at and receive from you the life-giving truths, the encouragement from your word, from one another. We as a body want to glorify you we want to change our families, and our, our community, our workplaces. We want to take this courage and go out for your honor and for your glory. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand with us in worship.
Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
Life-changing words right there. The Father knows. Our Father knows. And, and I can't help, but I have a picture in my mind. He, he's looking at some of you who are like Phoenix. You've tried and you tried and you tried and it doesn't work. You're falling down. And you don't think it's ever going to change. The Father's heart he, he's already done the work. The, the wood's broke. It's already done. Jesus hung on that cross. He just wants us to grow and develop so we can break boards too. Change this world for his honor and his glory. For those who were your, they don't leave here today until this community, somebody here, surrounds you and picks you up, prays for you. There's prayer in the back. Please come forward in the power of the Spirit. Walk. Walk in the power of the Spirit, the Thessalonian way. God bless you guys.